China was named one of the countries with the lowest crime rate in 2017 and one of the safest countries for tourism. Why is China such a safe place? And Beijing hosted an international conference on a trans-Caspian trade and transit corridor. How are the countries involved looking to benefit from the project? Welcome to The Point. Live from Beijing, I'm Li Xin. In the Travel Risk Map 2018 released late last year, China's travel security risk received a rating of low, that is a category second only to some northern European countries such as Iceland and Norway. China received more than 60 million tourists in 2017, according to the World Tourism Organization under the United Nations, becoming the fourth most visited country for traveling in the world. So with a growing number of tourists, how safe is China compared to other countries, both for traveling and for living. And with a population of 1.3 billion, how has China managed to achieve such a level of safety? Joining me for the discussion are Quentin Albert from Paris. He is owner of a social media video channel called uh, Xing Shi Dan Dan. And in the Beijing studio, Liu Yunming, assistant editor and chief commentator of the weekly periodical Beijing Review. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Quintin, um, you made a video right after uh, the uh, mass shooting in Las Vegas, uh, U.S. last October, saying that you have lived in China for seven years and never realized China was such a safe place until that moment. Um, here is a quick look at the, uh, this video. It's in Chinese, but just to give our audience an idea. So Quentin, explain to us what prompted you to make that video. Well, um, we're making daily videos now. I'm, I'm what is called a vlogger on the Xin Shi Dan channel. Mm -hmm. And we were visiting the US when something happened in Las Vegas and it was at the same time we were there. So as a vlogger, what you express is really like you're feeling at the moment. And it was for me really a, an extremely scary time because you, you hear people being extremely worried everybody in the hotel something is happening you don't know what it is you don't know what happened you don't know if it's a terrorist attack or if it's a fire or something and and all of a sudden you feel scared and for me it was the first time in my life i ever feel like scared like this and it's something that never happened in china and i grew up most of my time in china and it's such a big difference that it's only when you feel scared that you realize how safety is comfortable in your daily life Mm -hmm. You mean, uh, as Quentin said in the video and just now, um, only when you're not in uh, China and you're in, in danger uh, do you realize how safe this place really is. Uh, why do you think um, he is feeling this way or why do you think some foreigners would feel this way? Well, I think I can give you my own experience. Uh, in growing up in China, I've never think, thought of the pro uh, question whether China is safe or not safe. I, I think I guess I just took it for granted. I mean, life is supposed to be like that. But when I was in the U.S. for work in 2010, and after I was done shopping um, from Times Square, I took the path train back home to New Jersey. And when I got back home and turned on television, and the breaking news was an attempted bomb attack in Times Square that day. I mean, uh, the very moment when I left the bomb site. So that is exactly the time when I felt, well, this is my life can be in danger. I mean, I can be the victim of a potential terror attack. I mean, for foreigners in that kind of particular situation, and, and when you come back to China and you will feel the same way as Quentin um, had said in his video. Uh, I mean, I, I've never um, had the sense of feeling my life being threatened or in danger anywhere in China. Maybe, you know, a theft maybe, but not a life-threatening um, thing, mm -hmm. scenario. I, I think a lot of people will share that kind mm -hmm. of uh, experience. Quentin, were you in China, though, 
um, have you ever thought about it? Or after you came back to China, after um, you made that video in the United States, did you think about um, why you could feel safe in China? What are the reasons behind, uh, you know, the sense of security in China? It's. I think it's an interesting question, because. I grew up in, in France and it's like, um, it's a bit different. You don't feel safe all the time in France. You know that at night, you'd better don't go in the dark streets. Like, this is a place you shouldn't go because it's not safe. You might meet people who want to steal your money and stuff and they have potential weapons and things like this. But in China, it's very, very different. I came the first time to China when I was 17 and any time of the day, any time of the night, anywhere, when you meet people, it's only friendly people. I remember at 3 a.m. I would meet people in the street. They're all like eating or something, and they will invite you to join in. They will say, hey, do you want a beer? Do you want to join eating something? Or they will be just very nice and asking what you're doing so late in the night in China. So I guess it comes from, from people being like a completely different mentality of people. People are just more happy, more sharing. It's, it's, I think it's a healthy state of mind that Chinese people have and we lost in Europe, honestly. Viewing, what is your um, uh, observation? Um, is I think, I think there is a difference. Uh, well, the Chinese people are in general quite warm and I think a lot of people in developing countries are in general quite warm towards uh, strangers, um, towards foreigners. There is also a kind of a, a level of, you know, this is a guest who comes from far away, so we, we should be nice, we should be hospital. But besides that friendly factor, what else do you think has contributed to the extraordinary level of safety in China? Well, I think there are mainly two perspectives. One is institutional. And first of all, uh, and, and that the other is cultural. Let's start with the uh, institutional basis of the Chinese society. And um, first of all, China has very strict gun control. And um, well, when it, it greatly reduces the, the, the incidence of mass killing, mm -hmm. like the shootings in Las Vegas, because how far can you go with your bare hands? And second, secondly, and when we look at the Chinese um, streets, you can see a lot of uh, traffic surveillance cameras on the streets. And remember, these cameras are not just to catch people who violate traffic laws. And these cameras uh, are there to help the policemen to catch criminals. And remember, there, just a few days ago, there is a video which, which went viral on the Chinese internet, which uh, in says a few, uh, a group of policemen salute to a camera after they are done with their burglary case in just 36 hours. Because that camera helped them a lot in catching the, the thief. The, actually, it's a group of uh, thieves. So uh, this kind of um, cameras actually left the, the, the debate over whether privacy was being violated because of cameras went into oblivion. So, and, and then there is the third reason, because you know, China has a policeman, it has a chengguan, it's actually a social safety network. It has policemen, uh, chengguan, what we call urban management uh, officials, and we have our neighborhood watch, which are composed of uh, what we call chaoyang aunties and chaoyang grandmas. Elderly people who are retired, who have the time to help in the com right. community watches. But I want to go back to the point that you made about these uh, surveillance cameras. Mm -hmm. um, there are concerns, especially in the international media, that these omnipresent cameras are kind of uh, symbols of China's so-called police state and you know, watching everybody, um, where they're going, what they're saying, who they're meeting. Quentin, when you were in China, um, did you ever think about this? Did you ever feel that your, your personal privacy and freedom was being infringed upon? Absolutely not. And I believe that the sense of safety is so present and so comfortable that it's, it's worth it, really. I've, I've never felt looked upon, like really, like surveillance cameras have never been something that bothered me and I think I can talk for all my friends, all my Chinese and foreigner friends for the same thing. Every single foreigner who's been to China and lived in China they will say the same thing. China is the safest place they've ever been and it feels so good to be in China because you just never even think about your safety anymore. It's not something you think about but every time you come back home 
you start to grab your phone and to be careful about your wallet and all these little things that make your life a little more tense. So, no, nope, I don't think it's a problem. Mm. Uh, Rene, you were about to talk about um, a cultural aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a bit more about that. I, I think in, in the West, you also have this concept of community watches, you know, people who are voluntarily on guard to help the community. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a difference between these two concepts? What is special about the Chinese um, phenomenon? Well, I think there is a cultural reason behind it, because the Chinese culture values Confucianism, uh, which emphasizes on benevolence and emphasizes on harmony between people so um, when when see when there are something in the Western world like an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth the kind of statement idea in the Old Testament well the, the part of the Bible which I can never comprehend and also Confucianism would never fight against those who disbelieve in its ideas so I think it, it emphasizes on bringing people together it is not exclusive it is inclusive so the Chinese people are like uh, it, it, it emphasized on the middle way, the golden mean, which means you should never be too aggressive, nor should you be too um, cowardly. So it means the Chinese people are calm and peaceful, they're peace-loving people, and uh, in between, in the Chinese history, the Chinese people has suffered a lot of wars and battlefields, uh, incidents, so we, we treasure this kind of um, security, and we believe uh, stability and peace override everything else. Um, and a kind of individual, individual level of privacy, what you, you know, mentioned before, you know, can be easily um, uh, People are willing, let's say people are willing to sacrifice a little bit their individual freedom or privacy in order to keep the uh, collective security. Quinting, what is your experience with these uh, community watchers? Because sometimes they're a little bit nosy. They want to see what is everybody is doing. They want to ask you questions. Did you ever have any unpleasant experience because of that? Not at all. It's more like a friendly neighborhood. If you live in any small village in the world, all the neighbors will know, everybody knows what's happening. It's like, it's a community of people. So it's in the sense of living within a community, I think it does make sense that people watch over others' shoulders in case something happens. It's never been something that I suffered about and uh, it never made me uncomfortable at all. There as long as you don't have anything to reproach to yourself, it's, it's really fine. <laughs> it's a good point. Um, there is also a possible um, lack of inconvenience because of all the security checks you have to go through. I must say sometimes it is uh, a hassle when you have to go through the security check when you're rushing to get on the train at the train station. Uh, how do you look at this kind of um, unre you know, unrelented effort to provide security for the, for the people by the Chinese government? Um, I think it's, it's fine, like for example the airport, it's true, lots of people are there, but again it's really planned in a way that the security is handled as well as emergency as well as everything. If you arrive late to your plane, there is a special lane that is for you and the train is the same thing. I've, especially since filming in this Xin Shi Dan Dan vlog, we've been late to so many places, so many things, and all the time the authorities are really helping so it would be the most convenient as possible. So again, I really think that everything is made as much as possible to be convenient to people and to provide safety. Which again, I have no criticism at all about this whole system and the way it's led. I think it's, it's perfection. Honestly, it's really, really well done. So Thank you very much for that sound a bit too yeah. much, but really. Thank you, thank you. I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy that people uh, can have this kind of feeling um, when they're uh, traveling or working in China. Uh, anyway, we have to leave it there. Uh, many thanks to Quentin Alba joining us from Paris, owner of uh, Xing Shi Dan Dan Video Channel. Thank you very much. And uh, Liu Yingying, uh, assistant editor and chief commentator of Beijing Review. Thank you. And uh, here is my first point. Uh, safety to me is like air. Um, you're not aware of it until you are lacking it. And there are multiple reasons why China is considerably safer than many other countries in the world. The role of the government, the community effort, the public awareness, the culture, the individual's cooperation, etc. A lot of efforts and resources have been invested to give people the feeling of being 
being safe. And with the efforts continuing, I'm pretty optimistic that safety will not be an issue for China anytime soon, and I'll be happy not to talk about it again. You're watching The Point. We'll take a short break, and we'll be back right after this. Stay with us. Freight transport between China and Europe is set to get shorter. An international forum on the role of the Trans-Caspian East-West Trade and Transit Corridor in the realization of the Belt and Road Initiative was held in Beijing on Tuesday. Co-organized by China, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Kazakhstan and Turkey, the forum gathered government officials and business people from all five countries. Based on the concept of the Belt and Road Initiative, this corridor is a key route that better connects China and Europe and the countries in between. From China to Turkey or to countries along the Black Sea, the corridor cuts through Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan and Georgia. When completed, the route offers an attractive alternative for Central Asia to reach Europe and vice versa. So what opportunities is this route opening up? I talked earlier with uh, Rufat Mamadov, the president of the ASPROMO, the Azerbaijan Export and Investment Promotion Foundation, and David Javahadze, Deputy Head of the Transport and Logistics Development Policy Department of the Ministry of Economy and Sustainable Development of Georgia. I started by asking Mr. Mamadov what exactly the corridor is. Um, actually, uh, our initiative, uh, the initiative of uh, four countries, uh, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and uh, Turkey, um, is to um, um, increase the role of the um, uh, east-west transit and trade corridor between uh, basically um, China and uh, European countries. Uh, the major uh, aim behind that is uh, to uh, increase the uh, trade turnover between uh, China and Europe um, to offer um, um, more eased um, um, uh, way to uh, transport um, um, goods between the uh, two sides. Uh, but it's also about the um, increasing the bilateral trade and investment relations um, between all the countries right. um, um, on the route. Actually, this route is offered um, um, is a type of alternative. I can show you the map if you wish. So we have two traditional routes. One is the maritime route that is normally used by the um, uh, freight forwarders uh, between China and, and, and uh, Europe. That Having takes normally? Uh, that takes normally about 60 days. Okay. Yes. So um, um, then we have um, another route. It's um, um, starting in China and then going via Russia, Belarus, and uh, further to Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it um, takes about uh, 15, 16 days. Yes. Um, and what we are offering is a new route starting from China via Kazakhstan, Caspian Sea, over Caspian Sea to Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, or alternatively can uh, go via uh, Black Sea to Ukraine and then further Northern Europe. Why do we need the third route on top of the two yes, routes we The third now? route first offers um, less time consuming, a way to get your products from uh, mm -hmm. China to Europe or from Europe to China. So it takes about 14 days. Uh, we have already tested a route uh, um, both ways uh, via Georgia to Ukraine and further to Europe or and via uh, Turkey. Um, the route we tested uh, uh, via Turkey uh, took us about um, 11 days even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, to get the products. Um, and it's much cheaper than the other ways. Right. Mr. Jawahatek, do you have an idea, for instance, how much cheaper it will be? Has there been some kind of calculation, estimation on that? Uh, yes, there are some uh, preliminary estimations uh, around the total to transport container from China to Europe via the hour route will take uh, around 5,000 uh, US dollars per one TU, mm -hmm. per 20 feet equal equivalent uh, unit, but there is a, a significant opportunity to even more reduce this price because a lot of uh, transportation and infrastructure projects are ongoing along the middle corridor. I right see. Now. So when are we going to see this route in operation, Mr. Mamadov? Um, it's actually uh, 
I can say that it's actually already in operation. The whole story behind this to increase the capacity of the uh, 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 of the present food. So uh, for that reason, um, uh, there are several projects in uh, all the countries along the route. Uh, Kazakhstan is, is uh, increasing its uh, transportation capacity uh, the, of the um, um, port on the Caspian Sea. Azerbaijan is con co constructing completely new uh, port on the Caspian Sea, the largest one on the Caspian Sea, with a capacity of 25 million tons a year. Um, 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 we have, uh, we have, we are putting in, uh, into operation the so-called uh, Iron Silkway. Uh, so the Bakud Bilisi Cars Railway this year. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, plus um, uh, we, ha we, we are along with all these, uh, we are rehabilitating um, the whole um, um, infrastructure, um, sorry, uh, transport infrastructure uh, along the route in order to increase the capacities of uh, the transit capacities of it's the It's a huge road. operation yes, and cross-country um, Yes, it's a huge, huge uh, operation. It's, it consumes a lot of uh, investment. What's the expectation of the increased trade and the increased transit uh, along this route by the time it is finished? Do we have some kind of uh, concrete estimation? Uh, I, strongly, I strongly believe that uh, uh, this project uh, will be beneficial for regional states because it will promote new investments uh, through the corridor. It will promote people-to-people -people relations, uh, uh, increase the trade uh, activities and a lot of uh, new job places which is uh, also very important. Uh, I must also mention, mention that uh, the uh, uh, cargo turnover and the trade turnover between China and Europe around to several billion per day and uh, we have uh, uh, immense opportunity to cap capture a significant portion mm -hmm. of this cargo which uh, positively influence the social economic development of the original member states and also uh, incre increase the prosperity along the corridor. What about between countries along the routes, for instance, uh, from Azerbaijan to Georgia? What kind of uh, increased exchanges are you looking to? Um, actually, all the countries along, uh, along the route are traditional partners, economic sure. partners. Azerbaijan is an important uh, trade and investment partner for Georgia and vice versa. Uh, we are um, um, one of the largest investors in Georgia and one of the largest trade partners for Georgia. The same stands for us, uh, for Azerbaijan, with uh, Turkey and with Kazakhstan. What is also important is that um, uh, we want, uh, with this project or program, we want to increase the uh, level of engagement with China, uh, trade and investment engagement with China. We consider China as a very important partner, um, um, economic partner for us. Um, uh, for instance, in Azerbaijan, um, China has invested quite an amount, um, about uh, 770 million US dollars worth of investment. Uh, over 100 uh, companies with Chinese capital are operating in Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we are discussing with our Chinese partners um, um, new projects, very important mm -hmm. and large projects in the fields of um, logistics, in the fields of um, industry, um, um, uh, agriculture, um, which will definitely increase the uh, presence of Chinese capital in Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, trade turnover plus Azerbaijani companies are now uh, willing also to enter the Chinese market. So, and I believe that other countries, um, 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 our partners are also aiming the same. Um, there are some voices of a question, let's say, mm -hmm. in some Western media when they look at China's Belt and Road Initiative, such as this, such kind of a route, they would, uh, they have been uneasy thinking that China is trying to use this, this initiative to expand its power structure, to build some kind of a China-centered uh, political structure. Do your countries see it in any way in that light, Mr. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, Georgia is one of the 
uh, most uh, investment friendly countries in the world. We are number uh, nine in the uh, World Bank easiness of doing business uh, ranking. We are one of the least tax burdened country uh, in the world and we generally we are open, very open economy and uh, last year Georgia signed the free trade agreement uh, with China uh, uh, and we also have uh, Georgia is a member, associated member of the European Union. We also have deep and comprehensive free trade uh, um, agreement with China which means that uh, it's, uh, Georgia is a very attractive place for Chinese uh, investments to promote. You don't see it in any political light at all? Uh, I don't see any political light and I, I personally as a, being as a transport uh, expert I only see economic uh, f f background in it because China is the world's largest exporter, world's biggest industrial country so to me it's very logical and very well grounded that China seeks to diversify its roots and ha wants to have as many alternatives as possible. So for me it's very natural. Mr. Mamadou. Well, for Azerbaijan as well, actually not many people know that Azerbaijan was among the first countries to support, um, officially support the uh, One Belt One Road um, um, initiative and our president paid a visit to China uh, and signed even um, um, uh, a memorandum mm -hmm. uh, supporting uh, this initiative. Um, we consider this initi initiative completely um, economic one. Uh, we uh, see a lot of benefits and uh, we want to be um, uh, partners for China in the implementation of this um, um, uh, very important project uh, along with our partners. So, um, But we actually uh, see also a lot of interest in other countries towards uh, the project that we are developing together with all the partners um, on the east um, uh, west uh, transit and uh, trade corridor. We have done um, actually uh, presentations um, of this project in uh, United States, we've done it in Germany, in some other countries along Europe and um, uh, the uh, businesses are seeing this um, uh, project as very important for them and very interesting for them. Yes, um, for instance, uh, for uh, and and we see also the same um, um, uh, interest on the side of Chinese uh, business community. And our uh, today's event, we had over 400. Uh, Chinese companies present, so mm -hmm. that shows how much important um, uh, the project that we are offering is, is uh, for them. Thank you very much. We have to leave it there. And uh, I have been talking to Mr. Rafat Mamadov, President of ASPROMO, Azerbaijan Export and Investment Promotion Bureau, and Mr. David Jahadza, Deputy Head of Transport, Logistic Development Policy Department of the Ministry of Economy and Sustainable Development of Georgia. And that is it for this edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook or Twitter using the handle The Point with LX. Download the application called CGTN to watch the show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.